I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Susan Surrett. Um, Dr. Susan Surrett completed her PhD at Concordia University in 2014. She is a Shirk postdoctoral fellow at NASCAD University under craft theorist and historian Dr. Sandra Alfody, who we're very privileged to have in the audience here. <laughs> her field of research is ceramic relief murals within the context of the innovation, improvisation, and professionalization of ceramics in post-war Canada. While her dissertation was a case study of the extensive ceramic mural program of the Sturdy Stone Centre Saskatoon, her current research involves how our ideas of the gift impact the production and reception of ceramic murals throughout Canada. Her interest in writing an account of this body of work stems from her own ceramic practice that involves relief murals. She is the co-editor with Elaine Patterson of the forthcoming book Sloppy Craft, Post-Disciplinarity and the Crafts, published by Bloomsbury Academic, and it's to be released in June 2015. So please welcome me and or join me in welcoming Susan. <laughs> um, Ibsen's 1879 play, A Doll's House, ends with Nora leaving the family home, including her children, because, as she explains, she has a right to become a human being. Almost a century later, a year after Betty Friedan, Betty Friedan published The Feminine Mystique, Eve Merriam's 1964 feminist book, After Norris Slammed the Door, also highlighted the continuing unhappy predicament of contemporary women. While written in the early 1960s, these two American books were only possible because of women's experiences in the 1950s. In Canada, this period also motivated Federal Minister Judy LaMarche to lobby the government for a commission on women's rights, one not put together until 1967, purportedly because of press negativity. This paper puts a face on one Canadian woman who slammed the door at the end of the, night, the problematic 1950s, artist Greta Dale. I examined Dale's professional self-representation through her ceramic relief mural commissions, acknowledge her presentation as a 1960s woman within the prevailing constructions of femininity, and explore her role as a feminist. <clears throat> In many ways, this compelling 1967 press photo illustrates the inter intersecting categories of professionalism, feminism, and femininity that framed Dale's ceramic practice throughout the decade. A white figure in the foreground against the dark background of her mural, and in contrast with the dark-suited men behind her, Dale forthrightly gazes at the viewer. We are initially drawn to her eyes, and only then to be focused on the mural laid out upon the floor, and the men who have the power to accept or reject the finished work. Dressed in feminine and stylish white coat, a contrast to the dirty work associated with clay. Dale emerges as a key figure, challenging us with her professional presence. Born Margreta Lundborg in 1929 in Kelowna, BC, Dale studied at OCA uh, circa 1949 to 1953, alongside photographer and architect Jack Dale. In 1953, Greta and Jack moved to Vancouver, where they soon married and by 1956, the couple had two children. Like many Canadian artists, Dale pursued postgraduate studies outside Canada. Around 1958, she obtained a grant and accompanied by her family, spent a year in Mexico, studying with the renowned muralist Jose Chavez Morado. There, she was also introduced to Mayan architecture, which subsequently influenced her sculptural reliefs. Her interest in Mexican muralists was not unusual, as other Canadians were also influenced by the movement, including painters William Pereira of Saskatoon and Fred Ross of St. John's, New Brunswick. <clears throat> Back in Vancouver, Dale slammed the door on her life as Jack's wife and as a traditional mother to her to pursue her career. Around the same time, she completed two public mural commissions, one a figurative sgraffito that recently has been restored, 
while another representing BC Industries in a costume for a school in Surrey was a clear reference to Mexican muralism. Dale and her new partner, the architect W.R. Wilfred Usner, then left BC together. And aside from a short time in Montreal, 1962 to 63, with intermittent travels to Europe and Mexico, they were located in Toronto throughout the 1960s. Dale's lifestyle choices departed radically from expectations of feminine behavior at the time, emphasized in all the women's magazines as a stay-at-home suburban mother dedicated to her family. While American women's magazines, for the most part, vigorously promoted this ideal, there was a more nuanced understanding of women's issues in Chatelaine. Whatever Dale's particular motivations for slamming the door, when she did so, she began a new life, one that flew in the face of the expectations of the feminine mystique. Dale and Esther <clears throat> established a working and living collaboration while Dale aggressively pursued her professional career. Usher's client contacts were key to her obtaining some commissions, whilst others can be attributed to Dale's own growing reputation. Their close working relationship is evident in a joint brief Montreal business venture, Technique des Arts, they mounted in November 1962. According to the brochure, Dale is director and Usner is architectural advisor, would facilitate art commissions by bringing together artists, architects, and clients to assure budget, quality, aesthetic, and time considerations were adequately considered. Its, open co its opening coincided with Dale's exhibition of paintings and ceramics at the nearby small art tech gallery. Her interest in the abstract sculptural surfaces of Mayan architectural forms is evident in the gallery invitation. These forms evidently influenced several artists of the period, according to a 1969 reviewer, who remarked, almost every artist who visits Mexico tries something in the same lines. Dale's development of highly textured abstract surfaces was similar to that explored during this decade by several successful and well-known relief sculptors, such as Jordi Bonet. While not radically feminist, as were Eva Hesse's experimental works, Dale's reliefs adhere to a feminist strategy of the period assumed by sculptors who, sculptors who incorporated the codes of the male art establishment, while also taking on increasingly public subjects and abandoning traditional forms. Ceramic relief murals as applied art were certainly considered in innovative at the time, as mural history and contemporary contemporaneous practices focused on painted frescoes, painterly commercial tiles, and mosaics. Dale, never traditional, altered her name to Miss Dale, allowing her to remain professionally autonomous from her former husband and her current partner. Establishing a separate identity, unusual at the time, was adopted as well by the art critic, writer, and craft promoter, Anita Ahrens, who was married to artist Merton Chambers. Ahrens regularly promoted Chambers' work in her journal columns for Architecture Canada without publicly acknowledging their relationship. Whatever conflicts of interest we may be aware of now, such strategies gave the impression these women were professionally independent, especially important in an era when women artists and architects' works were regularly sidelined in regards to the professional output of their male partners. At the same time, Dale could and did take advantage of her relationship with Usner before percent guidelines were codified and when personal connections between artists and architects helped determine commissions. Dale's first traceable ceramic commission was for the Briarwood Presbyterian Church, Beaconsdale, Quebec, circa 1963. It is probable that this was facilitated through contact she made during her Montreal ventures. However, it is known she made the clay reliefs for the baptismal font, lectern, and front doors from a basement studio in her Toronto home. A home studio often associated with amateurism because of its ties to domestic spaces, certainly kept production costs down, 
but threatened Dale's already fragile professional identity as she established herself in the new city. These reliefs were made from rough Credit River clay acquired just outside Toronto, presumably from one of the well-known brickyards active in the area. Fine clay sources for sculptural products were not readily available at this period before efficient supply chains and fine-tuned recipes were established for and by studio ceramists. The textured clay body determined to some extent her um, sculpting technique as delicate forms were impossible to render. She also created at least two other commissions for churches, including ceramic panels for louvered windows. Church commissions were often given to women, especially in this era, where there was a building boom in sacred spaces. Perhaps Dale and other women were willing to work for less money and appealed to the tight budgets of many smaller congregations. Or perhaps they were not often considered for the few large commissions that were available. In fact, just working as a woman sculptor in Canada in the 1950s and 1960s was considered challenging. John R. Lewis observed in a 1960 newspaper article aptly titled, Why Would a Woman Want to Be a Sculptor? That a good professional Canadian sculptor, although having works in the public domain, would be known only by a small circle of friends and admirers and would receive the wages of a bricklayer for hard physical and highly skilled creative work. For a woman sculptor, these trials would be doubled. Dale persevered with her reliefs. She probably did not receive much of any formal training in ceramics. The ceramics program at OCA, which when she attended, evaluated by Alberta sculptor Luke Lindo as populist and naive and only slightly better than high school, was geared to creating small models for works to be realized in other media. Toronto Central Technical School did have a well-equipped and established ceramics department, but it emphasized vessel production, the dominant ceramic expression of the era. Five potters, <clears throat> Toronto women who had trained together at Central Tech, founded a cooperative studio in 1957 and did undertake a few architectural commissions in the 1960s, but there is no record of Dale working with them. Ontario muralist Merton Chambers, who had followed up his own OCA education at the Royal College of Art in London in the late 1950s, evaluated the five potters as, quote, exceptional examples of people who were not professionals, but who produced quality work as opposed to the bulk of amateurs in the 1960s who treated pottery as entertainment, unquote. This dismissive, dismissive remark was typical of the challenges facing women ceramists. Perhaps it was partially based upon Harold Burnham's 1959 definition of a professional craftsman, where at least 50% of their income must come from their work. Recently, the definition of the professional artist, and especially the professional woman artist, has of course been problematized and within the current discourse, the five potters in Dale would, without question, be considered professionals. Dale appears to have developed her own working methods, a strategy required of most ceramic relief sculptures at the time. The art of ceramic relief murals was in its infancy in Canada in the 1950s and 60s, a situation little different from the United States and Europe. For instance, in 1965, Modernist ceramic sculptor Ruth Duckworth undertook a commission for the geophysical department at the University of Chicago without any experience in mural making. Certainly, in the case of North America and England, ceramic education in the first half of the century had not favored sculpture and hand building techniques. The lack of information <coughs> about building structurally sound, texturally interesting, and um, colorfully pleasing complex sculpture surfaces, along with limited access to appropriate clays and equipment, such as slab rollers and effective kilns, were very real challenges. In these early stages of the genre, Quebec ceramic muralists particularly made their mark 
including Paul Vermette, Jordi Benet, and Maurice Savoie, each developing their own individual approaches. Dale's time in Montreal could have made her aware of the very early work of these muralists, but in any case, like her contemporaries, she had to develop her own working methods. Dale's first major ceramic uh, mural commission was executed for Sarko Canada's new facility in Toronto, a building designed by Esner. With its intricate surfaces of cut bricks within which were integrated abstractive figures representing sympathy for man, it was clearly influenced by recently excavated Mayan architecture and the social philosophy of Mexican muralists. Sarko Canada had wished to show how much the company was interested, quote, in all people as individuals, unquote. The mural received an ambivalent review from Architecture Canada's allied arts columnist, Anita Ahrens. In a rather condescending manner, Ahrens positioned Dale as a minor artist who was producing valuable and interesting work with much sincerity and integrity and some ability. <laughs> she did concede that the mural in question was a quite delightful terracotta. The mural installation was covered in the business section of the Globe and Mail, which highlighted the artist as a petite woman, especially in contrast to the side of, size of her work, and pointed out she also acted as an interior decorator for the new building, a more traditional role for a woman. A year later, Ahrens had changed her mind about Dale, enthusiastically dedicating a page to her work in a catalog she published in conjunction with the University of Toronto and the Canadian Architectural Institute. Ahrens also subsequently included her in a 1967 exhibition of arts and architecture and participated with her in a radio interview. <clears throat> Dale's last major ceramic work was the untitled mural, mural, or screen it was called at the time, created for the Manitoba Centennial Concert Hall in 1967. This was one of four artworks commissioned for the building's interior that included aluminum panels by Tony Toscana, silk wall hangings by Takeo Tanabe, and panels by Kenneth Lockhead. Dale was the only artist chosen who did not have close ties to Manitoba. The Concert Hall Building Committee considered the acquisition of these works to be a budget priority, allocating almost one half of the fine arts budget of $60,000 for the lobby screen. This substantial sum positioned Dale's work within the remunerative range of a contemporary well-known male muralist competition. In, in mid-1966, the committee sent out their call to specific artists among them Dale, perhaps known to them through Usner or her association with Arabs. Initial submissions that included examples of previous works were reviewed by William Townsend of London Slade School of Art. Townsend, also used by the National Gallery, ensured an international professional standard, and subsequently Dale moved on to the next commissioning stage. Her ability to navigate professionally stood her in good stead. When her maquette was submitted for approval, the Arts Committee, comprising Winnipeg architects, university professors, and distinguished citizens, issued specific instructions for more masses of color. In consultation with the architects, Dale had already agreed to provide a brick footing and extension extent play with that of the maquette. In designing and fabricating this mural in sections for easy transportation and handling, Dale turned once again to bricks as her base unit form and material, still inspired by Mayan textures and sectional building techniques. She cut the bricks at a variety of heights and cut and reformed wet brick clay to construct the architectural shapes around her sculptured, sculptured figures. It also appears that she transformed transform wet bricks into some of the abstracted human forms through cutting, sculpting, gouging, and pushing. The dynamic mural with figures representing dance, music, and drama was completed in 1967 and installed in January 1968. Neither the building 
nor the mural were included in architectural or art reviews at the time. However, Dale did receive press recognition from the Toronto Star. When a completed section of it was displayed in Aaron's March 1967 Art for Architecture exhibition. Below a fashion spread in the women's section, the article covering the exhibition character characterized the works as handicrafts, a term still contentious within craft discourse. The implication was that they were part of daily domestic traditional production, amateur and not quite art despite their innovative materials and designs, often monumental dimensions, and a high level of skill and edu education required to execute them. The Toronto Telegram also covered the completion of the mural, sending a woman reporter to visit Dale's new large studio in an industrial downtown building, required because of the mural's exceptional dimensions. The thrust of this rather enlightening article Contrast Dale's femininity, including her lithe and fragile body, described as 120 pounds and five foot four, to her reputation as an accomplished artist. This work quoted, a pair of trim bronze legs, bare to the mid thigh, come slowly into view. The elevator stops, and there is this delicious little creature with long blonde hair oval face and steady gray eyes, waiting in the great 2,500 square foot studio. She's dressed in a snappiest pale blue plastic mini suit and looks much too young to be smoking the long filter tip cigarette in her hand. As for her being the creator of that five tons of mural spreading out like a great barnacle whale behind her on the floor, the whole idea is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But it's true. At 37, Greta Dale is Canada's top woman muralist and among the country's best half dozen artists in this demanding and increasingly popular field. These two articles highlight prevailing attitudes towards particular artistic mediums and gender that situates Dale's struggles to be taken seriously, at least in the popular press. The same press reportedly hostile to Lamarche's suggestion for a council on the status of women. The last documentation of Mail's artistic output dates from 1970. She had turned to fiberglass sculpture, finding it more flexible than clay. While she indicated she wished to focus on painting, no traces of her work appear. Her 1978 death notice makes no mention of her career or Usner, referring to her only as the mother of her two children. In fact, her daughter has discovered that there is little information about her own mother. At her death, Dale, a pioneer in her medium, was unfortunately publicly recognized only by exactly what she had signed the door upon. Thank you.